Britain's Conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, it's Theresa May back in the House of Commons today, and yes, of course, inevitably, it is Brexit, is it not? Very odd that Theresa May has said that the ball is in the European Union's court. She feels she's made all the concessions that are necessary, but Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, snapped back by saying the ball was firmly in the British government's court, and that unless we gave more, they wouldn't even begin to move on to the next stage, which of course is talks about any future trade deal between us and the European Union. So we do appear to have a little bit of a stalemate. Uh, and given that Theresa May is going to be coming on the show with Ian Dale tomorrow at five o'clock, she'll be here in the LBC studio taking your calls, I thought what we'd do tonight, ahead of her appearance, is for you to give me advice for the Prime Minister. What is it that she needs to do next? And I will, over the course of this programme, tell you what my advice would be to the Prime Minister if I had a private little chat with her. So if you think, continuing with the ball games analogies, that she needs to start playing hardball with the European Union, then call me on 0345 973. Perhaps you think it's all too late and she simply ought to throw in the towel, in which case you can text to 84850. Maybe you think actually the real answer is Mrs May needs to show them just a little bit more love and then maybe they'll give us what we want, in which case on Twitter, on at LBC, using the hashtag Farage and LBC, let me know what you think. And, of course, you can watch the show live on Facebook and comment there. So she was up before the House of Commons at half past four today. She told them she wants to find a creative solution to a new economic relationship with the European Union and that the UK could operate as an independent trading nation post-Brexit if no deal is reached. Here's a little of her statement earlier on today. Businesses will need time to adjust and governments will need to put new systems in place and businesses want certainty about the position in the interim. That's why I suggested in my speech at Lancaster House there should be a period of implementation and why I proposed such a period in my speech in Florence last month. During this strictly time-limited period we will have left the EU and its institutions but we are proposing that for this period Access to one another's market should continue on current terms, and Britain also should continue to take part in existing security measures. The framework for this period, which can be agreed under Article 50, would be the existing structure of EU rules and regulations. So it's a defence, really, of her Florence speech and her position, and she's rebranded, of course, the word transition now as an implementation period although I of course thought that that was what article 50 was all about that was the transition I thought I didn't think we needed another two years or three years or whatever it may be uh, but I think with what she said in her statement she perhaps had reached an uneasy truce with her own Eurosceptic backbenches until yes Jacob Rees-Mogg great favourite of this show, Jacob Rees-Mogg, got up and questioned her further on how rules, new rules in particular, would operate during the transition period. Will my right honourable friend confirm unequivocally that after the 29th of March 2019, the European Court of Justice's writ will no longer run in any way in this country, and that any new laws that are agreed under the Acqui Communautaire after that date will not have effect here unless agreed specifically by Parliament. My, my honourable friend has actually raised two separate issues, but elided them to, uh, together. The first is about the European Court of Justice. As I've just said in uh, answer to a number of questions, we want to have a smooth and orderly process of withdrawal with minimum disruption. That's why we want that implementation period, and we have to negotiate what will operate during that implementation period. And yes, that may mean that we will start off with the ECJ still governing the rules we're part of oh for that period. Oh dear. But what we're also clear of is that we uh, can bring forward discussions and agreements on issues like a dispute resolution mechanism, and if we can bring that forward at an earlier stage, then we would wish to do so. Now, the second issue my honourable friend referred to was the question of new rules that are brought in during that implementation period. Um, given the way that things operate, 
it is highly unlikely that anything will be brought forward during that period that hasn't already uh, started discussions through the European Union, to which we are being party of until we leave, and on which we would have been able to say whether there would be a rule that we would sign up to or the rule that we would not wish to sign up to. Um, and any new rules that were put on the table during that implementation period, given, again, the way these things operate, it's highly unlikely they would actually be implemented during that implementation period. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Highly unlikely is not the unequivocal answer that Jacob Rees-Mogg asked for. Jacob Rees-Mogg has an ability in the House of Commons to get up and to ask crisply and quickly the pertinent questions that matter. He asked her, could she confirm that the European Court of Justice would not rule over this country during the transition, or to use her word, implementation period? And she said, no, it would. And then when he asked her, what about new rules that come in during that two-year period? Will they apply to us as well? And she says it's highly unlikely that that circumstance will occur. But of course, that's not quite the same, is it, as saying no. In fact, that's a very sort of soft way of saying yes. So I think what Jacob has done today, and he's done it, not because he wants to sow dissension within his own party and within Eurosceptic ranks, I think what Jacob has done today is to highlight the fact that, frankly, when we keep being told we're leaving the European Union at the end of March 2019, well, it doesn't really sound like it very much, does it? Because we'll be leaving it in name, but not much else. So, Jacob's advice to the Prime Minister is she should unequivocally say the foreign court will have no say, will accept new rules, but she's going to be sitting here at this very desk tomorrow at five o'clock, and I'm asking you, LBC listeners, what advice would you give to her? And bear in mind that on the 19th of October, there is a European summit where she will go as the leader of this country and sit round a table with 27 other national leaders. And that, I think, is going to be a very important date for Mrs May. She struggled on since that calamitous speech in Manchester last week. She's still the leader. But I sense, after today, and in particular, in response to Jacob Rees-Mogg, there's going to be some degree of fermenting anger out there. My first caller this evening is called Nigel, and he's from Swansea. He's a new caller. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. How are you? I'm, well, I'm well, but I keep, oh, I keep wanting to believe the Prime Minister's going to do the right thing, and then, as soon as we get into the detail, Nigel, as a Brexiteer, I just feel she lets us down. I think so. Uh, uh, well, i got three points I was going to make. I'll make them quick. Okay. Um, this is what I'd suggest to her. Yep. Number one is set a deadline to stop talks and negotiations straight away. Yep. So that, whether that be in after the 19th oct uh, of October with a summit, we could you know, set the time down for a month's time. Stop the talks then, and then we can start uh, carrying on to talking with uh, Commonwealth countries or, you know, America, other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, the other point I'd make is, uh, just, just, just a point of reference, is we've only got seven Remainers out of 25 Cabinet men members, which, uh, you know, I just don't understand that. But, uh, and, and the third point really is we need to use the other countries, you know, the, um, the European countries as our levers of negotiation. So as soon as we walk away from the table, they will do the work for us. Uh, you know, you've said before, you know, you've got the, uh, the French uh, wine growers. Yep. Absolutely, and the German car makers and the Belgian chocolate makers and all the rest of it. Nigel, your first point about a deadline, I think, is something that will... Uh, I don't think you're going to be the only caller in this hour that says that, because increasingly that is the kind of pragmatic view uh, that I'm getting from people who say, look, we cannot have these people dictating terms to us like this and being as unreasonable as they are. It's about time we gain the initiative. Your point on the other countries is absolutely crucial because what Juncker and Barnier said from the outset is you only talk to us, you only talk to Brussels, you're forbidden from talking to the member states directly and then went over the heads of the British government and started talking to the Welsh government, the Scottish government uh, they're even now in negotiations with Sinn Féin over what they can do in Northern Ireland uh, and I think you're right, I think it is by going to national governments, it is by going to European companies that we might start to get some voices out there saying something that's vaguely pro-British and um, 
In fact, there were one or two signs of encouragement, Nigel, from Denmark today, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Nigel, thank you for your calls and your ideas. Craig is calling me from Tunbridge Wells. Good evening, Craig. Good evening, Nigel. It's a honour to speak to you. Once again, another first-time caller. What advice have you got for Mrs May tomorrow, Craig? What's she got to do? Grow some minerals. Right. Really, quite frankly. (laughs) You know, she she, she clearly lacks courage, leadership... You know, either put somebody which in his very, very small, dedicated team to negotiate directly with Juncker and Barney and all that lot, and they're either going to play ball, which, or they're not. They've well. demonstrated, quite frankly, that they're not going to play ball. So, what have we got to lose by just... Well, David Davis has that job, Craig, doesn't he? I mean, David Davis has delegated that. Well, he's a lovely, lovely chap. Yeah. But honestly, really. You know, he's been guided by Mrs May, and he doesn't... He's not, you know, forceful enough. So what office. you're saying, Craig, is not only is the Prime Minister uh, lacking in terms of clarity and direction, but you feel that our negotiating team aren't being tough enough. Well, I think, absolutely. I feel, personally, they're not being anywhere near tough enough. The European Union have not moved their position one little bit. They're just a case of, sod you, whatever, not interested, they certainly you know. haven't been overly constructive, Craig, thus far in the process, have they? Right, so you're for getting tough, standing up and saying, let's do this, yeah? Yeah, yeah. The, that's a beautifully diplomatic way of doing it. Yep. They're telling us to get stuff in no uncertain terms. Yep. Quite frankly, what have we got to lose by walking? OK, Craig, I thank you. And I, but I'm also very keen to hear from people who are Remainers um, as to what they think the Prime Minister ought to do. Um, a common very common theme that I'm getting uh, comes from Athena on Twitter when she says, I would tell her four words. Get on with it. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.15. After that speech... <coughs> tell me... <coughs> shows what good the Chancellor's cough sweet is. Can the Prime Minister find her voice? In the week she launches a major review of racial disparity in the UK, join me, Ian Dale at Drive, as Theresa May takes your calls. The Prime Minister, Theresa May, tomorrow from 5, exclusively on LBC. How did a military tank end up beneath a Surrey vineyard? And what will be left of a German bomber in a Liverpool marsh? Join Madness frontman Suggs and expert relic hunter Stephen Taylor as they dig up World War II treasures and work to uncover the fascinating tales buried with them. World War II Treasure Hunters, 9pm tonight on History, part of this month's World War True season. The war you know, the stories you don't. Watch History on Sky, Virgin, BT and Talk Talk. <laughs> Darling, what's wrong? I missed a call. It was that big order. And when I called back... He'd already gone with another supplier. <laughs> Why? Why didn't we have e-receptionist answering and directing our calls? Avoid the horror of the missed call from just 30p a day with e-receptionist. Visit ereceptionist.co.uk for your free 30-day trial. <laughs> free trial must be cancelled within 30 days to avoid fees. Every week, thousands of people sell with webuyanycar.com. Whether it's a Fiesta or a Ferrari... A Mini or a Merc, a Beamer or uh, some, something else beginning with B, uh, a big bright blue Bentley. WeBuyAnyCar.com makes selling any car simple, fast and hassle-free. Probably why it's called WeBuyAnyCar.com. Change the way you sell your car. Enter your reg number now at WeBuyAnyCar.com. Terms and conditions apply. See WeBuyAnyCar.com slash info. I'm really proud of my dad. He put everything into the farm, you know. Plowing the fields, fixing the fences. Now I think of it, he spent more time talking to his tractor than he did to Mum. When it came to organising a hearse for his funeral, there was only one choice. At the co-op, we know how important those personal touches are. With over 100 years of experience, we'll do everything we can to help you give a loved one a fitting farewell. Co-op Funeral Care. Call or visit us online. This weekend, England's two most successful clubs go head-to-head at Anfield on the Sky Sports Premier League channel. Liverpool and Man United battle it out in one of football's biggest rivalries. Upgrade today for this weekend's action and enjoy more top clashes including Everton v Arsenal, Spurs v Liverpool and Man United v Spurs. Live only on our new channel dedicated to the Premier League. Now £18 a month. Search new Sky Sports. Cancellation requires 31 days notice. Further terms apply. 
There's no need to scream and shout if your plumbing's gone right up the spout. There's a local hero for that. If your lights are leaving you in the dark, there's no need for a rude remark. There's a local hero for that. Whether it's plumbing, heating, drains or electrics, we've got a local tradesman who can help. There's no call-out charge and all work comes with a 12-month British gas guarantee. Book online now. There's a local hero for that. Localheroes.com Leading Britain's conversation. LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. Theresa May comes into LBC at five o'clock tomorrow to take your calls. I'm asking you, what advice would you give her? And this against the backdrop of a relative stalemate, I think, in the negotiations, where she said the ball is in their side of the court and they've said the ball is in our side of the court. And I can promise you there's no shortage of advice coming through. By text I get, Nigel, these talks are going to get nowhere. The EU will be the winners of these negotiations and will be the losers. Leave now. I make a success at Brexit, not a failure. Australia, says Rab. And from Burnham on Sea, John suggests, I would say to Mrs May, that now that the EU has said that the ball is in our court, not theirs, why doesn't she say that unless the EU starts negotiating properly soon, we will just walk away? And lots and lots of messages along that line. There is an increasing view that, that the EU are not being reasonable, and perhaps we have to walk away. But I'm keen to hear from people who think that would be a disaster and think she should try something different. And we're staying in Tunbridge Wells uh, for our next caller. But before I go there, the previous caller was also from Tunbridge Wells. He was Craig, and he suggested, why don't we start talking to European countries, to European companies? Why don't we ignore... Juncker, Barnier, the Hofstadt and the Brussels crew. Well, a little chink of armour of, in, in the armour appeared today. Something I think quite significant. Um, and it's the first time we've really seen this in the Brexit negotiations. But Denmark has warned the European Union to stop playing games over Brexit, over the divorce bill, and has urged Brussels to begin talks on trade. This came from the Finance Minister, Christian Jensen. He said, in any political negotiation, there is not enough time, not enough money, not enough this, not enough that. This is part of the game, because what we are dealing with here is not rocket science. We are now on the same page. In my view, it is rather important that we get a more close and speedy process on concluding some of these issues. The EU is a great trading partner of 27 countries, a strong ally in defence and security, so we need to find out how we can have a good, close relationship post-Brexit. It's important both sides are ready and able to move on. Otherwise, we get into an endgame where things are very precious on time and therefore a greater risk of making decisions that are not welcome. So that, I think, is incredibly positive. The Danish finance minister is saying, please, stop these games. Let's start talking about trade at the same time as we talk about everything else. And I have said for months and months and months on this show that what the British government ought to be doing is ignoring Juncker, Barnier and Verhofstadt and there should be a road show travelling around Europe speaking to European exporters who need the British market and saying to them, for goodness sake, put some pressure on your government. In my own little way, I gave that speech in Berlin, I gave that speech in Prague. I have managed to get at least some coverage in the European newspapers for this, but this is something the British government, in, con in conjunction with British industry, ought to be out there doing, in my view. John, from Tunbridge Wells, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Good what, evening. What is your advice for Mrs May? What, you know, what would you tell her well, in a quiet, well, private chat? If <laughs> 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 Rightly or wrongly... Whatever you think of Theresa May, uh -huh. I believe, personally, my opinion is that she's been extremely badly assisted in the way that she's approached this. And what I would suggest is that she creates an advisory think tank made up of some of the biggest names in industry, mm -hmm. specifically those that are pro-Brexit. So you're talking about uh, Dyson, you're talking about Bamford, you're talking about Tim Martin of the Weatherspoons chain, those sort of people, yeah? I'm talking about people who know what the hell they're talking about. Well, there may be That's others, John. I mean. John, there That's may be other point. business people. There may be other big business people who take a different view, to be fair. 
Well, that's all right. Well, that's fair. But she's got to get someone on her side Mm -hmm. that knows what the hell they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Only in an advisory capacity, you understand. Got nothing to do with government. But they can say, for example, um, if you want to deal with this particular person who's involved in violence, this is the way to do it. Do you know what, John? Do you know what, John? I think you're bang on the money. I think you're bang on the money, because right at the moment, the advice she's taking comes from career politicians and from a professional civil service in Whitehall. I do not see any business figures going through the door of number 10 to sit down and advise the Prime Minister, firstly, on what business and industry needs, and secondly on how to negotiate, because people in business put together deals. They do this as part of their lives. Their success as as businessmen and women depends on putting together good deals, and virtually nobody in government has done a business deal in their life. John, I think you're absolutely right. Whether it would be uh, an advisory think tank, what the structure would be, but I think you're right. Get some hard-headed businessmen in to help the government fulfil its agenda. After all, John, the manifesto said Brexit means Brexit, didn't it? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I think it's high time she stopped relying on people that are one minute they're the MP for education, the next minute they're the MP for science, and the next minute they're the MP for the NHS. Yeah. They're just politicians. They're figureheads. Yeah. No, John, all the work, John. All the work is reliant on good, sound information. I would say, I would say, John from Tunbridge Wells, you've given us a good dose of common sense. I thank you very much for your call. Up to any of you to tell me that John is wrong. Perhaps John is wrong. Perhaps businessmen and businesswomen shouldn't be involved in this. I certainly think they should. Uh, On Twitter, I get the EU will insist that her implementation period bridges the next election so Corbyn can overturn Brexit in all but name. Well, Corbyn today was very critical. He did make one very good point, which is here we are, 16 months on from the Brexit vote, We don't appear to have got anywhere. As a criticism from Corbyn, that was right and proper and fair. It's just that, unfortunately, (laughs) his own record on this since the general election is lamentable because he's U-turned on everything from open-door immigration to the single market. Hi, Nigel. What bit of leave doesn't Theresa May understand? There will be a rebellion. If the ECJ continues after March 2019, she's a Remainer and must go, says John from Wales. James calls me from Derby. James, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Nice to speak to you. So what is your advice for our PM? Um, I think I'd really echo a lot of the the information I've heard, you know, up until now on your programme tonight, to be Mm -hmm. honest. Um, Mm -hmm. John, your previous caller, who was saying, uh, you know, maybe is is it time for an advisory board of some sort to really be you know, assisting the PM in what are clearly going to be, you know, extremely difficult negotiations. Everyone understands that. Um, But is it time for, as you say, business leaders to get involved? And, you know, really, shouldn't we we be talking about a cross-party advisory council as well so that we can get, you know, more views of more people represented in the Brexit negotiations? Well, possibly, James, but I think John, the previous caller's idea was better than that because I think part of my criticism is there are too many politicians and bureaucrats and civil servants involved already. Wouldn't it be great to get a fresh voice of business involved in this? So I, I, I think that emphasis, James, to me, is more important, and I think, from what I can understand right now, it's a missing dimension. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I'd, I'd go on to say, you know, I would support the kind of idealistic, what I just said about having cross-party support and business leaders, mm-hmm. but we're not getting any solid information from any of the party leaders about exactly how they would go through Brexit. You know, it's a lot of rhetoric. Uh, no, I know. And I, under I, the table dealings and I, stuff, and it's frustrating. I wonder, James, because Dominic Raab, um, the young Tory MP was on one of the politics shows yesterday and said that privately the government are preparing for a no-deal scenario. And I wonder whether that's true. I hope it's true, because what's yeah. for certain is that Osborne and Cameron had made zero preparations for it to be a leave vote, and I wonder whether they are preparing for a no-deal scenario. And if they are, then they should. They must bring in every single business involved. But I... Yeah. I mean, James, do you have confidence in this government to take through Brexit? 
No, no, not at all. I mean, uh, you know, I have to tell you, Nigel, I didn't, I didn't vote for this government. Um, I'm not a, uh, a Tory supporter. Yep. Um, I would feel out of, out of all the parties, historically, you would think that maybe it would be the Tories who would offer up the most common sense. But obviously, we, you know, we haven't had that. Um, I'll say I voted for Jeremy Corbyn, uh-huh. not because of his policies on the European Union, for, for other things. OK. Um, and would you, and, and James, are you a younger voter? Uh, I'm 22, so... so, well, well, so well, y- yeah, youngish, yeah, yeah. I think, still, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. And, I mean, would you, would you vote Corbyn again, given the U-turn he's performed on the European Union, or would that be low down your <sighs> list of priorities? My, my, my feeling, ultimately, is now is not a time for us to be changing the government. As unfortunate as a position we are in, is anyone offering us anything better? You know, if we were to have a general election tomorrow, that as far as I can see, is only going to weaken our hand in, in negotiating. I, I don't think we can have a general election until after, you know, Brexit negotiations. But when, when are they going to end? You know, as mm. with what, you know, Mrs May was saying today, it seems like it could be a never-ending process, really. So it's very hard to gauge. But I don't support um, a change of government before negotiations are over, definitely. Mm. OK, James, no, very interesting point indeed. Um, stop the whole thing. It was clearly based on total lies, and we are worse off already. As a result, I get from Thick as Brexit on Twitter, somebody who thinks the whole, the, the, the greatest exercise of democracy in our nation's history should be thrown in the bin, as it simply doesn't matter, because all of us that voted Brexit, all 17 million 410,723 of us are really too stupid to make decisions like that. Well, I tell you what, thick as Brexit, whoever you are, whoever you are, we haven't changed our mind. And a lot of your crew now believe in what we believe in, that Brexit is a good thing, not a bad thing. And it's time the government got on with it. But Theresa May clearly is in need of a lot of advice. And maybe, just maybe... It is LBC listeners and callers tomorrow directly with the Prime Minister that may give her a new guiding, shining light so she can lead the country on to great success. You never know. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.30 and time for the news with Philip Chrysikos. Theresa May has told the Commons the UK will not be members of the single market or its customs union, instead wants a creative solution. Updating MPs on Brexit, the Prime Minister added progress will not always be smooth, but the UK can prove the doomsayers wrong. An inquiry's heard Margaret Thatcher's office was warned about allegations Cyril Smith was a child abuser, but allowed him to be knighted. Claims surfaced against the former Liberal MP for Rochdale before he died seven years ago, but he was never prosecuted. A former bouncer has been jailed for at least 15 years after trying to make a bomb using fairy lights. The judge described Islamic State group fan Zahid Hussein from Birmingham as a dangerous offender who'd been bedroom radicalised. LBC weather dry across the south with rain over the north this evening and overnight, a low of 12 degrees. Tomorrow showers across the south, dry elsewhere, ahead of heavy rain in the northwest, a high of 7 17 degrees. LBC Travel and the M25 is queuing clockwise. That's from Junction 24 for Potter's Bar to Junction 26 for the Mabby, and it's because of a breakdown in the Homesdale Tunnel and two lanes are closed. Now, the A10 in Tottenham, that's closed in both directions, just south of Bruce Grove Station. It's because of an accident, and it's causing queues from Seven Sisters and from White Hart Lane Station. And there are delays on the A40 eastbound. That's from Denham towards the Polish War Memorial in North Holt, as a car has broken down. LBC Travel, I'm Anne-Marie Walsh. This is LBC. Hi, I was hoping to get a price on selling my car. Online, they offered me £3,000. OK, how about £4,000? What? Really? Brilliant. Yeah, great news. We buy any car too, but we pay £1,000 more. We call that one of life's small victories. Bring Vauxhall a quote from the leading online car buyer and we'll beat it by £1,000 when you trade in your old car for a brand new Vauxhall. Plus, that's on top of our other great offers. Search Vauxhall buy any car. Vauxhall, isn't life brilliant? Offer and part exchange for new passenger car orders which are registered by 31st of December based on the true condition of the vehicle. Participating retailers only. Terms and conditions apply. See vauxhall.co.uk slash we buy any car too. Oh, I said, let's get a new kitchen. Like I was getting a coffee. What was I thinking? Demolishing a room and making a new one? Who does this? And how am I an actual grown-up? Relax, relax. It's trust a trader. Just type in your postcode, what you need, and bam, local tradespeople appear. All who know what they're doing. For realsies. Oh, maybe I should get a new bathroom too. 
and a dress up room and a room for the kittens. Visit trustatrader.com. Whoever they want to be in life, give them a great start with Wellkid. Carefully balanced, great tasting vitamins and minerals for 4 to 12 year olds with specific nutrients such as zinc and vitamin D, which support normal immune system function. The Wellkid range from Vitabiotics. From Boots, Pharmacies and Vitabiotics.com. <laughs> Darling, what's wrong? I missed a call. It was that big order. And when I called back, he'd already gone with another supplier. <laughs> Why? Why didn't we have e-receptionist answering and directing our calls? Avoid the horror of the missed call from just 30p a day with e-receptionist. Visit ereceptionist.co.uk for your free 30-day trial. <laughs> free trial must be cancelled within 30 days to avoid fees. Can you think of a reason why you shouldn't apply for an Ocean credit card? There's a credit limit of up to £1,500. They send you text so you keep control of your spending. And you can see if you'll be accepted before you apply at checkocean.co.uk. Plus, checking won't affect your credit rating. But before you go and check, there's just one reason why you shouldn't. Because you've already got an Ocean credit card, right? Otherwise, get checking. Go to checkocean.co.uk. Intelligent Lending Limited is a credit broker. Capital One is the exclusive lender. Another one drives the duster. Another one drives the duster. Hey, why don't we get one too? Another one drives the duster. Get in on the action with the Dacia Duster SUV. And with the Dacia Scrapping Scheme, you can save up to £1,000 when you swap your old car for a brand new Dacia Duster. Order by the end of this year and register by 31st of January 2018. Dacia, you do the math. Exclusions apply. Eligibility criteria apply. Participating dealers only. Visit dacia.co.uk slash scrappage to find out more. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Prime Minister May appears here in the LBC studio tomorrow at 5pm. Ian Dale will take her through a series of calls from you, the LBC listenership. And on the eve of that, I'm asking you, what would your advice be for the Prime Minister? But, of course, a very important story that we've been covering over the course of the last week, the events in Barcelona and in Catalonia. There was a slight softening of positions over the weekend when the Spanish government apologised for those that had been hurt by their own brutality from the police. But uh, tomorrow is a big day and... There is a, a chance, a possibility, um, some would see it as a threat, that uh, Catalonia could declare independence tomorrow. Well, we're going to go straight to Barcelona and join LBC's political editor, Theo Asherwood, who is there this evening. Good evening, Theo. Good evening, Nigel. Yes, Barcelona is waiting with bated breath to see uh, how Carlos Pigamon, the president of Catalonia, indeed Catalonia is waiting with bated breath, to see what he has to say uh, tomorrow evening. We are expecting him to say that there will be a symbolic declaration of independence rather than a unilateral declaration of independence, uh, which many within his own side, especially from the coup party, which makes up part of the government, really, really want, and therefore we could see civil unrest as a result. But at the heart of this, Nigel, and this is something that I think has been overlooked, is a real detestation, I think wouldn't be putting it too strongly, of the European Union. Now, of course, in the UK, Euroscepticism has traditionally been seen as being brought out, born out of right-wing politics, but here in Catalonia it has been born out of left-wing politics. This idea that the European Union, by failing to stick up for uh, the victims of police brutality at the hands of the Madrid-led, Madrid-ordered uh, police uh, the weekend before during that referendum, has simply turned its back to the human rights of Catalans. Now I've been speaking to Bernat Salazas, and he's a member of that coup party, and he told me that for his voters uh, within Catalonia, the European Union had simply failed them. I think one of the most interesting things of this uh, situation is the discussion about the European Union. Um, I'm from a left party, okay, I'm not nationalist any anyway, um, but I think that uh, European Union is uh, is not useful for the interest of the working people and uh, for the you know for the big parts of, of our people here. So for me, uh, for my party, we 
want to be out of European Union and to build an alternative uh, way of making politics in Europe in the 21st century. So uh, that's our opinion. Uh, we know that in the Catalan society are different opinions between uh, about this question and there's a lot of people who think that we must work after independence to to op to be again in the European uh, Union but um, there is also some people who thought that before but after the the answer that the European Union uh, give us this week uh, with uh, after referendum there's a lot of the lack of support you're referring to there yeah the, they haven't support us they haven't uh, criticized the Spanish government by using by using violence with a lot of citizens against a lot of citizens so I think that the position is changing and I think that's very interesting but that is something like uh, brexit in, in another situation obviously but gives to the people the right to decide uh, what relation we want to, to to have with the European Union well, Theo, I mean, that's a cattle exit, isn't it, we're hearing? And I thought very interesting the point that he made that they're a left-wing party. I've always thought Euroscepticism, actually, um, in the Mediterranean and elsewhere, would probably come from left-wing parties. Uh, but tell me, Theo, one of the reports we heard a few days ago was that there were three battle cruisers moored off Barcelona from the Spanish Navy with Spanish soldiers on board prepared to come in and take over the capital if independence was declared. What is the latest situation on that? The latest situation is that there are two boats which have been described to me as hotels for military police. That's the Mossos police, not the uh, civil guard which would be the Catalan police. This is the national police from Madrid which was responsible for the brutality after the referendum. Two boats with around 4,000 military police off the coast of Barcelona and another boat with another 4,000 or so police further down the coast at Tarragona should uh, there be a declaration of independence, unilateral independence, uh, tomorrow. Now, I've been speaking to uh, Francesc Benais, and he is uh, told me he works for the Catalan National Assembly, which is the, if you like, the overarching sort of people's movement behind this. Uh, and he's told me that uh, they are expecting violence if indeed there is that declaration of unilateral independence tomorrow night. We have, I think, three, three vessels, three, two in Barcelona, one in Tarragona. Huh? In which main is the main is uh, uh, Barcelona, which uh, I don't know how many people are there, how many policemen, eight thousand, six thousand, I don't know exactly, but thousands of police there. Uh, they are using this vessel as, as as a hotel. Okay, then they said they will stay here just to prevent the referendum. They haven't prevented the referendum. Now they are expanding the the, the, the situation or the, the expanding yes the the, the, the stay just to prevent the, 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 the unilateral declaration of independence or even to, to control, to block our society until they thought they will be under control. Do you think they'll invade if there is a declaration of independence? Oh my God. Probably. It's a risk. They are very aggressive. It's unbelievable. We are peaceful people. Absolutely. Never just we will stay probably sit down in the, in the floor and they will come over for us. Huh? And they are very aggressive. And then... And they're armed? Uh, they so, have weapons? So, yeah, they have weapons. Even they use the, the rubber, rubber ball, bullets. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. They have used, and tear gas? Uh, gas, uh, they say some in somewhere, but uh, in some village there. Yes. They, they, they are prepared to, to, to fight this, this, this kind of uh, reaction of the people. No? And they have used in the referendum case. No? And uh, I guess that they will, uh, they will use, they will use it again, even even worse. Now, Nigel, we are expecting the key statement from Carlos Pigamore, the Catalan, Catalan president, uh, tomorrow evening. There'll probably be a lull, and it very much depends on whether he can, if you like, find that middle road that keeps the coup. The left-wing anarchists who of course want independence at any cost happy and then also keeps the Madrid government happy. It's a really fine line to tread for Carlos Pigamont if he wants to avoid yeah. uh, the violent clashes that, that we saw a couple of weekends ago. Theo, thank you very much for that very sobering report. I mean, we're in the 21st century.
we're talking about a country, Spain, that is a spo- supposed to be a modern democracy, supposed to have left Franco and fascism way back in the 1970s. And yet, and, and by the way, I've never, ever before talked about Catalan independence or been a supporter of it. I've been pretty neutral about the question. But to see the way those police behaved in trying to stop a vote from happening does make me think uh, that if the president tomorrow of Catalonia was to declare unilateral independence from Spain, that something pretty ghastly would happen, which makes me guess, which makes me guess that the president of Catalonia will perhaps just hang back a little bit from it. But let's see. Huge story. And big implications, not just for Spain, very big implications for the European Union. You see, the EU have said today, and they've been backed up by the French government, that if Catalonia unilaterally declares independence, they will be expelled from the European Union, which, from the sound of that left-wing party, would lead them to having a great big celebration. Uh, I think if we did finish up with Catalexit, Uh, The implications of that for the European Union would make Brexit for Brussels look like a Sunday afternoon picnic. But, but, Brexit is our picnic and we need to get it right. So what should Mrs May put in the hamper and take with her when she goes to Brussels on the 19th of October? I'm going to ask Colin in Finchley that very question. What goes in the hamper, Colin? Good evening, Nigel. Good evening. Nigel, I'm going to come to you from a different angle, you okay. know. You're, going to, you're probably going to think I'm off my head, but <laughs> I'm telling you that everybody's having a pop at her, oh. and it's unfair, because this goes back to Cameron's fault. He went to the country. Mm. The country said, we want to come out. Fair enough, OK? But when he went, before he went to the country, he should have had plans all drawn up that if it goes wrong for him, which it did do... That's why he ran away. Like a, he packed up and run. I've never seen any Bernie run so fast in all my life. But he ran away. <laughs> he was gone pretty sharpish, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. yeah, his bottle went. Instead of having plans, he knew months he was going to the country. They should have got a big plan together to say, if it goes wrong, this is how we're going to go to Europe with the deal. Mm-hmm. You see, the trouble with all, everybody in England, everybody wants guarantees. And you know, in life, Nigel, there's the only two guarantees I can give you is that you get a birth certificate and you get a death certificate. Yep. Everything else, you make your own no, life. You're absolutely and right. Make your life. Dr. Johnson's death and taxes, the only two certainties, I agree. Colin, that from Finchley, thank you. Colin laying the blame at Cameron's door. Can I add to that? George Osborne, they arrogantly thought they'd win the referendum, they made no preparations at all. And Colin is right in one way Theresa May's job is to pick up those pieces. But, come on, it's been 16 months since Brexit, and we appear to have got nowhere. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, it's 7.45. Coming up at 8 on LBC, Clive Bull. Theresa May has told the Commons that real progress is being made. Do you think Brexit negotiations are on track, or is the whole thing a bit of a shambles? Clive Bull on LBC. In need of adventure? Then escape with us and travel through an exotic Arabian market to a sultan's palace and a breathtaking cave of wonders before you discover a whole new world soaring through the stars on a flying carpet. Come on in, let the magic begin with Disney's spectacular West End musical, Aladdin. Start your journey at aladdinthemusical.co.uk. Well, happy driving. Cool. And who's that lying on my X-Trails roof? Oh, that's Mike giving the sunroof seal a final once-over. So if you could drive a little bit slower. Because we know every Nissan from top to bottom, you get even greater peace of mind. So visit Nissan's used car event from the 6th to the 23rd of October, where you could drive away a used 65-plate X-Trail from £18,957, subject to availability at participating dealers. Google Nissan cared for to find your nearest dealer. Winter can hit you hard if your boiler's not up to it. So make sure your home or business stays a step ahead this winter with a new boiler from British Gas for half price. You'll still get our full fixed price guarantee and our full five-year warranty. And you'll only pay full price for the installation. 
Oh, and don't worry, you will get a full boiler. It's only the price we've cut in half. But hurry, this half price offer ends 31st of October. Get yours now and be a step ahead this winter. Search British Gas New Boiler. Conditions apply. Calling all units. Reports coming in of Sky's gripping new cop drama, Tin Star, Epic Game of Thrones, and loads more shows, all with Sky TV from £20 a month. Sky TV and Sky Q, the next generation box, have been sighted in the vicinity. Witnesses report watching wirelessly all around the home for just £12 extra a month. Units should respond immediately and search Sky Q to join or recontract. Sky, believe in better. Sky Q multi screen and upfront payment required. £20 standard setup, Sky Q kit loaned at no cost, new 18 month TV contract, terms apply. Oh, I said, let's get a new kitchen, like I was getting a coffee. What was I thinking? Demolishing a room and making a new one? Who does this? And how am I an actual grown up? Relax, relax. It's Trust a Trader. Just type in your postcode, what you need, and bam, local tradespeople appear. All who know what they're doing. For realsies. Oh. Maybe I should get a new bathroom too. And a dress-up room. And a room for the kittens. Visit trustatrader.com. Oh, Churchy, look at that snazzy new car. Like me in the glory days. Before I got written off. My blinkers had that keen sparkle and my pipes. Well, don't get me started on my pipe. <laughs> oh, no. If your car is written off, you can choose between a replacement, paying for an upgrade, or the money. Time to pass on the baton. Oh. Churchill, depend on the dog. Comprehensive cover only excludes theft claims. Exact match subject to availability. Minimum car value £3,500 or cash replacement. Upgrade available when difference is paid. Underwritten by UK Insurance Limited. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 What's our advice for Theresa May? Alan says to me on Facebook, you can't negotiate with a bully, so stand your ground. Bullies back off when you show them you're not scared. Alan, I called her Theresa the appeaser in the European Parliament last week. It seems to be the British position is, the more we give, the nicer they'll be to us. And yet the more we give, the more they ask for. And the goal of even talking about trade gets pushed further down the track. There's no point trying to appease Juncker, Barnier and Verhofstadt, they are fanatics. Fanatics in their belief of building a United States of Europe. And you could think that's a good thing, you could think that's a bad thing, but they are fanatical in that belief. I've spent nearly 20 years working with these people. Believe me, I'm right. Paul is calling me from Brentwood, and another new caller. Paul, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. So what should the PM do? What's your advice? Come on, you've got the PM... (laughs) On your own, in a quiet room. What are you going to tell her, Paul? Well, in the, in the politest terms, yep. the PM is what she is. She's a politician. Uh-huh. She is not... Her her whole career has been built around shuffling paper around, which is <laughs> neither good nor bad. Right. She's, not, she's never run a business. She's not a deal maker. I take it you're she in business, Paul, are you? people to do a deal. What's your business, Paul? Tell me. Um, I've got a couple. One's electronic, so, yep. you know... And uh, I know, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no Donald Trump, but I know one thing. When you're in the superior position, you can basically do whatever you want. And, as soon as, and the first person who mentions numbers generally loses. We need a businessman to walk in there and say, these are what we're going to do. Yep. You can either take it this way or, nah, we're going to walk away. And see how long Volkswagen Audi before the, the boss of the And they'll are come the running boat. after us, Paul, won't they? Well, of course they will. You will look out in your high street, every other car is a Mercedes or BMW. That's right. That's right. You want them over here, you can bring them. 20% import duty. How long (laughs) is it going to take? Simple. But no one's got a pair big enough to do it. I know some, I know some guys out in this in this in this country that would sell a, an Eskimo a hundred tons of snow and they wouldn't even know what happened. <laughs> so this, this is, is what we need. Some good solid business advice coming from the heart of Essex in Brentwood, Paul. You've made me smile, but actually. You're absolutely right. You're not the first caller tonight. Thank you very much for calling. You're not the first caller tonight that made the point. These people have never been in business. They've never done a business deal. They don't understand how the real world works. I do agree, I have to say, with an awful lot of that. Ray says, we don't need permission from the European Union to stop payments to the EU now. Well, maybe that's the advice. Stop paying the money, Mrs May, and perhaps they'll start talking to us incredibly quickly. Stephen says, what is it? 
about the UK paying a divorce bill? Why can't the UK be a recipient of any divorce bill? The amount we have paid into this dictatorship, it should be worth millions. Stephen clearly very much from the hard line. Others take a different view. Nigel, I've always thought that it should be a pleasure to do business with you. I firmly believe, with a little bit more love on our part, the EU would stop digging in its heels so much. Well, it's a perfectly reasonable point of view, but I just wonder how much more she can give than she already has. Alex in Norfolk suggests that Mrs May, and this is his advice to her, should read the Ladybird book of negotiating as it would be far advanced on her skills so far. Michael is calling me from Hull. Hull, Michael, what should she do? Well, she needs to change her transition plans because essentially we've got a worse form of EU membership for two years. You know, yes, because we, we go on paying money, we lose our voting rights. Yep, no, absolutely. E even the labour option's better. You know, with the labour option, we could control our fish waters, control our agricultural policy, we could sign trade deals. With this, it's a worse form of EU membership. And she also needs to shake up her cabinet because Boris, frankly, has become an embarrassment on the world stage and Hammond is a bit too glum. So... Well, well, he's... I mean, Hammond is serious. I mean, is he really glum? Oh, I think that his negative aspect is actually having a bad effect on business, to be quite okay. honest. And, and I, other than Boris upstaging the Prime Minister, Michael, wh what is it that makes you say he's now a joke on the world stage? Well, you know, you hear from all these European diplomats and the comments about Libya and, uh, and the constant undermining. Now, he might have a point in certain aspects, but those are the cabinet discussions not to be put on daily press. Briefings. Mm. And it just, it, in, in fact, it confuses the negotiating teams on both sides. It makes okay. Now that may be a reasonable point. That may be a reasonable point. So, will on both sides. So, so, Michael, what should she do? I mean, she's she's rebranded it as an implementation period, not a transition period. Should yeah. she should she scrap that idea? Um, I, she still needs a transition period of sorts, but she needs to say, look, it will not last longer than this point, you know, at most probably two years. Yeah. And she also needs to make clear, on the, on our side at least, that she's serious about a no deal. I've seen people suggest a Secretary of State for no deal. But, you know, at the moment it looks like that she's not being entirely serious well, about the election. It, and it's a proper negotiating gambit, so she needs to make it clear that there are plans for no deal. You're absolutely right, Michael, because on the one hand, you can't say we're considering no deal, and on the other, speak in Florence about how wonderful virtually everything in the European Union is and how we'd like to be signed up to it, albeit slightly rebadged. Michael, I thank you. Michael, they're questioning the transition period and pointing out that actually, after the end of March 2019, we will still effectively be members of the European Union, but just with a very much worse deal for a period of time that we don't know. My last caller tonight on this subject is David, who's calling from Malden in Essex. David, good evening. Hello, Nigel. Um, my point would be that, if, as you would be aware, Yanis Varoufakis, the yep. ex-Greek finance minister, yep. is going around Europe, and as you can see this on YouTube, He's done a lot of discussions explaining that when he went to the European Union and explained that, look, the, the best deal for you would be to allow us um, to go ahead with my plans. And that way, not only would you get your money back, and Schaubler took him privately into a room and said, look, Yanis, you're correct. He said, but what you don't understand is too much political capital gone into this project. Absolutely. And even though it's not to your benefit or our benefit, we have to press ahead with this. And what's happened lately, what with Macron, you can see where this is heading. So in my view, negotiations are completely useless because it won't be allowed to happen. We need to just say we're out. And you've said this for years. Yeah, I mean, David, I... I'm, I'm all for us having a sensible free trade agreement, but to get that, we have to assume we're dealing with rational people. We have to assume we're dealing with people who say, do you know what, this UK market, we sell them 70 billion quids worth of goods more a year uh, than the other way around. It's good news. It really matters for European companies and European jobs and the European economy for that trading relationship to continue. But David, you're right, and Varoufakis actually is at the heart of it. We are not dealing, David, with rational people. We're dealing with people who have a political dream. They believe in a European Union. David, just quickly, would you advise Theresa yeah. May before taking the radical step to at least set a deadline and to give people notice of our intention. 
Absolutely. You have to be more definite. And the fact is that even if a deal could be struck that would benefit Europe as well, they will not go for it. They've yeah. proved that. And so what we have to say is, look, this is what's going to happen. Walk away. Well trade. Uh, uh, Organisation rules. rules. Yep. And then do our own dealings as free nation. David, from Alden Essex, my last call of this evening, David's advice there, crisp and clear, and my final thought on this is, uh, Prime Minister, you've absolutely got to get that ball back. You said the ball was on their side of the court. Get it back on your side of the court and start serving, because you've got aces that you can deliver. They want our markets. They may not in the short term go for it, but ultimately, if we're tough, we set a deadline, we say we're not going to muck about beyond that. There's a great big world out there. Do you know what? Even if we do walk away, they will come running back after us. You hold the good cards, Theresa. Don't appease the others. Now, don't forget, Theresa may We'll be taking your calls with Ian Dale tomorrow evening here on LBC at 5pm and you'll be able to tell me what you thought of all of that at 7 when I'll be back here too. Coming up at 10, it's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you. Well, we're going to continue this uh, conversation with Theresa. Britain's conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, it's Theresa May back in the House of Commons today. And yes, of course, inevitably, it is Brexit, is it not? Very odd that Theresa May has said that the ball is in the European Union's court. She feels she's made all the concessions that are necessary. But Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, snapped back by saying the ball was firmly in the British government's court. And that unless we gave more, they wouldn't even begin to move on to the next stage, which of course is talks about any future trade deal between us and the European Union. So we do appear to have a little bit of a stalemate. Uh, and given that Theresa May is going to be coming on the show with Ian Dale tomorrow at five o'clock. She'll be here in the LBC studio taking your calls. I thought what we'd do tonight, ahead of her appearance, is for you to give me advice for the Prime Minister. What is it that she needs to do next? And I will, over the course of this programme, tell you what my advice would be to the Prime Minister if I had a private little chat with her. So if you think, continuing with the ball games analogies, that she needs to start playing hardball with the European Union, then call me on 0345 973. Perhaps you think it's all too late and she simply ought to throw in the towel, in which case you can text to 84850. Maybe you think actually the real answer is Mrs May needs to show them just a little bit more love and then maybe they'll give us what we want, in which case on Twitter, on at LBC, using the hashtag Farage and LBC, let me know what you think. And, of course, you can watch the show live on Facebook. The Court of Justice's writ will no longer run in any way in this country, and that any new laws that are agreed under the Acqui Communitaire after that date will not have effect here unless agreed specifically by Parliament. My, my honourable friend has actually raised two separate issues, but elided them to, uh, together. The first is about the European Court of Justice. As I've just said in... Uh, answer to a number of questions. We want to have a smooth and orderly process of withdrawal with minimum disruption. That's why we want that implementation period and we have to negotiate what will operate during that implementation period. And yes, that may mean that we will start off with the ECJ still governing the rules we're part of oh for that period. Oh dear. But what we're also clear of is that we uh, can bring forward discussions and agreements on issues like a dispute resolution mechanism, and if we can bring that forward at an earlier stage, then we would wish to do so. Now, the second issue my honourable friend referred to was the question of new rules that are brought in during that implementation period. Um, given the way that things operate, it is highly unlikely that anything will be brought forward during that period that hasn't already uh, started discussions through the European Union, to which we are being party of until we leave and on which we would have been able to say whether there would be a rule that we would sign up to or the rule that we would not wish to sign up to. Um, and any new rules that were put on the table during that implementation period, given, again, the way these things operate, it's highly unlikely they would actually be implemented during that implementation period. 
Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Highly unlikely is not the unequivocal answer that Jacob Rees-Mogg asked for. Jacob Rees-Mogg has an ability in the House of Commons to get up and to ask crisply and quickly the pertinent questions that matter. He asked her, could she confirm that the European Court of Justice would not rule over this country during the transition, or to use her word, implementation period? And she said, no, it would. And then when he asked her, what about new rules that come in during that two-year period? Will they apply to us as well? And she says it's highly unlikely that that circumstance will occur. But of course, that's not quite the same, is it, as saying no. In fact, that's a very sort of soft way of saying yes. So I think what Jacob has done today, and he's done it, not because he wants to sow dissension within his own party and within Eurosceptic ranks. I think what Jacob has done today is to highlight the fact that, frankly, when we keep being told we're leaving the European Union at the end of March 2019, well, it doesn't really sound like it very much, does it? Because we'll be leaving it in name, but not much else. So Jacob's advice to the Prime Minister is she should unequivocally say the foreign court will have no say, we'll accept new rules, but she's going to be sitting here at this very desk tomorrow at five o'clock and I'm asking you LBC listeners what advice would you give to her and bear in mind that on the 19th of October there is a European summit where she will go as the leader of this country and sit round a table with 27 other national leaders and that I think is going to be a very important date for Mrs May she struggled on since that calamitous speech in Manchester last week she's still the leader but I sense after today, and in particular, in response to Jacob Rees-Mogg, there's going to be some degree of fermenting anger out there. My first caller this evening is called Nigel, and he's from Swansea. He's a new caller. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. How are you? I'm, well, I'm well, but I keep, oh, I keep wanting to believe the Prime Minister's going to do the right thing, and then, as soon as we get into the detail, Nigel, as a Brexiteer, I just feel she lets us down. I think so. Uh, uh, well, i got three points I was going to make. I'll make them quick. Okay. Um, this is what I'd suggest to her. Yep. Number one is set a deadline to stop talks and negotiations. But, and comment there. So she was up before the House of Commons at half past four today. She told them she wants to find a creative solution to a new economic relationship with the European Union and that the UK could operate as an independent trading nation post-Brexit if no deal is reached. Here's a little of her statement earlier on today. Businesses will need time to adjust and governments will need to put new systems in place and businesses want certainty about the position in the interim. That's why I suggested in my speech at Lancaster House there should be a period of implementation and why I proposed such a period in my speech in Florence last month. During this strictly time-limited period, we will have left the EU and its institutions, but we are proposing that for this period, access to one another's market should continue on current terms, and Britain also should continue to take part in existing security measures. The framework for this period, which can be agreed under Article 50, would be the existing structure of EU rules and regulations. So it's a defence, really, of her Florence speech and her position, and... She's rebranded, of course, the word transition now as an implementation period. Although I, of course, had thought that that was what Article 50 was all about. That was the transition, I thought. I didn't think we needed another two years or three years or whatever it may be. Uh, but I think with what she said in her statement, she perhaps had reached an uneasy truce with her own Eurosceptic backbenches until... Yes, Jacob Rees-Mogg, great favourite of this show, Jacob Rees-Mogg, got up and questioned her further on how rules, new rules in particular, would operate during the transition period. Will my right honourable friend confirm unequivocally that after the 29th of March 2019, the European... ...negotiation straight away, yep. so that, whether that be in after the 19th Oct uh, of October with a summit, we could you know, set the time bill for a month's time. Stop the talks then, and then we can start uh, carrying on to talking with uh, Commonwealth countries or, you know, America, other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other point I'd make is, uh, just, just, just a point of reference, is we've only got seven Remainers out of 25 Cabinet men members, which, uh, 
you know, I just don't understand that. But uh, and, and the third point really is we need to use the other countries, you know, the, um, the European countries as our levers of negotiation. So as soon as we walk away from the table, they will do the work for us. Uh, you know, you've said before, you know, you've got the, uh, the French uh, wine growers. Yep. Absolutely, and the German car makers and the Belgian chocolate makers and all the rest of it. Nigel, your first point about a deadline, I think, is something that will... Uh, I don't think you're going to be the only caller in this hour that says that, because increasingly that is the kind of pragmatic view uh, that I'm getting from people who say, look, we cannot have these people dictating terms to us like this and being as unreasonable as they are. It's about time we gain the initiative. Your point on the other countries is absolutely crucial because what Juncker and Barnier said from the outset is you only talk to us, you only talk to Brussels, you're forbidden from talking to the member states directly and then went over the heads of the British government and started talking to the Welsh government, the Scottish government uh, they're even now in negotiations with Sinn Féin over what they can do in Northern Ireland uh, and I think you're right, I think it is by going to national governments, it is by going to European companies that we might start to get some voices out there saying something that's vaguely pro-British and um, in fact there were one or two signs of encouragement Nigel from Denmark today which I'll talk about a little bit